Hello and welcome to this session, Get Lower Latency and Higher Throughput for Java Applications. My name is Simon Ritter, I'm the Deputy CTO of Azul Systems. As a little bit of introduction to me, I am a Java champion and I have won the Java One Rockstar Award twice for presentations I've done there. I've been working with Java for over 25 years. Um, in terms of challenges, I think that the 99th percentile is really the hard part of performance, which is why I wanted to do this presentation to help you understand some things about that. Away from work, I have uh, a real interest in cars and my son and I are currently restoring a classic Mini. Okay, so to get started then, what we need to think about when we're talking about Java is what are the performance challenges that we face specifically in an environment where we're running with the JVM. And you can really think about those in three different ways. They're kind of orthogonal, but they're all related to performance. The first of those is latency. When we send a request to the JVM and we don't get the response back straight away, this is primarily due to garbage collection. If you look at the way that most collectors work, in order to do their work safely and move objects around within the heap, what you'll find is that they pause the application threads to do that work. The longer it takes to do that work, the longer the application threads get paused for, the longer the latency you get in terms of your application. And what you typically find is that the pause times are proportional to your heap size, not to the live data. And that's quite important because the bigger you make your heap, the longer the pauses can be. Second aspect is throughput, and this is where we see the fact that Java uses a virtual machine and needs to take bytecodes and convert them into the native instructions. Now that can be done in a number of different ways. You can use interpretive mode where it's just directly translating bytecodes into instructions, or you can use JIT compilation with either a fast compiler or a heavily optimizing compiler. And how much optimization happens there is the key to how much performance you're going to get. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later on, especially with the idea of what are called de-optimizations, where you make an assumption about how to optimize code and perhaps you get that wrong and you need to throw away the code and start again. And then the last thing, again, in terms of Java related to this idea of JIT compilation is the time that it takes to compile all the methods that you're using frequently and get to the optimum level of performance for a particular application. That takes time and it needs to happen every time that you start up the application. So this is called the warm-up time. Now what we've done at Azul is to look at those things and figure out how can we improve the efficiency of the JVM. And specifically, what we did was we said, okay, let's start with OpenJDK. It's an open source project. We don't need to start from scratch and write a whole new JVM. We make some changes to that and related back to the three things that I showed on the previous slide in terms of performance challenges, we've changed three specific areas. So we replaced all the garbage collectors in Hotspot with one that we call C4. We've replaced part of the JIT compilation system, the C2 JIT compiler, with one called Falcon. And we've included new technology already now to eliminate as far as possible that warm-up time. Having done that, we need to make sure that it's still Java. So we run all of what are called the TCK tests on that. And that's somewhere between 100 and 150,000 tests that you need to pass on a Java environment to prove that you conform to the Java standard. So we do that. What that means is that in terms of your code, you can take your existing application, you don't need to make any changes to the code, you don't need to make any recompilation, you can just take your jar files and your class files, change the path in the Java home, and off you go. So it's a drop-in replacement. Now if we look at those things in more detail, the first of those is garbage collection. So this is the C4 collector I mentioned. That stands for the Continuous Concurrent Compacting Collector, and essentially that tells you what the algorithm does. It runs continuously in the background, monitoring the rate of allocation of objects and how much space is available in the heap. When work needs to happen for garbage collection, it does it fully concurrently. All the application threads can continue doing their work whilst the garbage collector does its work. That eliminates the problem of pauses. But even further than that, to get around the problem of not being able to reallocate space and move objects around, it is a compacting collector. We will compress objects down to eliminate fragmentation. From a basic point of view, this uses similar algorithms to the ones that we have in many other 
algorithms. So it is generational, meaning that we divide the heap up into two generations, young and old. The reason behind that is that you find in Java applications, they follow the weak generational hypothesis. Most of the objects that you're going to allocate will only be used for a very, very short space of time. If you can do most of the garbage collection in the young generation, you can significantly reduce the load on the old generation, which contains the long-lived resident set data that you're going to be processing with your application. We use the same algorithm on both generations. So even though we do have two, two regions, we use the same algorithm. And that still works very well in terms of reducing pauses and eliminating the problems of latency. In addition to being concurrent, all of the phases that we have are parallel, meaning that we can apply multiple cores, multiple threads to that, and have the work finish more quickly. Very important is that unlike many other algorithms, we don't have a stop the world compacting fallback situation. Things like G1, which is the most common collector in hotspot, at some point will reach fragmentation levels that are unsustainable. And so it will pause the application, do a full compaction on the whole heap, and it will take a long time depending on how big your heap is. What that means for us is that we can scale from heaps all the way from 512 megabytes up to 12 terabytes without any change in terms of latency. From an algorithmic perspective, it uses three phases, it's mark, relocate, and remap. One thing to, to mention here is that we've decided that this is only supported on Linux. The reason being that we actually do some, some clever things in terms of the way that the memory management happens. We use some specific system calls in the kernel, and we also have a kernel module that we can use for larger heaps to optimize memory even further. The way that we can do things both concurrently and relocating objects is through the use of a loaded value barrier. Effectively, it's a read barrier, and what we do is we intercept the reference to every object that you have, and we will look at the state of the object header and determine whether we need to do some work. That enables us to enforce two rules. First of them is that every object that you get a reference to during the marking phase will be marked. That means we can't accidentally garbage collect an object that you're using because they're always going to be marked. The second thing that happens is that we guarantee that when you're using an object and we're doing relocation or remapping, then you will get the right position of that object in heap to be able to make changes and not lose those changes. From a performance perspective, even though we're intercepting every object reference, because we only use two instructions, we do tests on the bits, and then if necessary, we jump to a handler, that reduces to effectively one micro-op on the Intel architecture, so it's less than one nanosecond of overhead, and compared to memory access in the cache or even main memory, you won't notice any difference. How this works is in terms of the concurrent marking phase, we use a similar approach to other algorithms. So we create a root set of all the objects that are directly accessible from your application code. We scan the stack, we look at the registers, we look at the static variables. The garbage collection threads will start working through that, and for each object, they will mark using the bit in the object header to indicate that that object is in use. We must then trace from that to other object references and mark those as well. And we will follow recursively all the object references, building up a complete graph of accessible objects. The root set is a nice separated set of object references. So we can decompose that into multiple threads. We don't suffer any problem of contention and can do that in parallel. The application threads are running at the same time. So at some point we may get to a situation where we access an object, we do our test and jump, the test failed because we haven't set the bit to indicate this object is in use. So what will happen is we will then have the handler do the work of the garbage collector in the context of the application thread just to set that bit. The rest of the tracing is handled by the garbage collector. So we'll pass a reference to that to say you follow the rest of the references. We're then into the relocation phase. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the fragmentation here of our five objects, A, B, C, D, E. We can relocate those by using free space in the heap and move A to A prime and B to B prime and so on. We can put a lock around that to prevent any inconsistent data. And then what we'll do is we'll create a side table which records all the changes in references. 
Then we move to the remapping phase where we need to update the object headers to reflect the fact that we've relocated those objects. Again, the garbage collection threads will work their way through the side table, updating the object references and then setting the bit to indicate that work has been done. Again, decompose that into multiple threads, have it handled as quickly as possible. The application threads are still doing their work. So at some point we access an object, we do our test, that fails, we jump to a handler. The handler will then take the information from the side table, update the reference, set the bit, and then pass that to the application thread. That guarantees that we always get the right position for the object in terms of the position and we can update it without losing any changes. How can we show that this actually works is by using a thing called jhiccup. And jhiccup puts an extra thread alongside your application. It's designed to monitor the latency of the JVM and everything below it, the operating system and the hardware and so on. jhiccup thread will go to sleep for one millisecond. So it spends most of its time asleep to avoid affecting performance of the application. When it wakes up, it looks at the difference between when it expected to wake up and when it actually did. If you get a 20 millisecond GC pause, we'll record that 20 milliseconds, generate some log files in terms of histograms, and then graph those to show what's going on. This is an example of that. So we've got an Elasticsearch running with 128 gigabytes of memory. We ran that twice on the same machine, same workload, first time with hotspot, second time simply change the JVM and run as all prime. On the left, we can see the typical kind of graph for the way that we see uh, latency. Lots of small spikes, which are minor GC pauses, a couple of big spikes, which are major GC pauses. On the right hand side, we can see as all prime, where you've got a much more sort of weird looking graph and lots of spikes there. But that's deliberate. I've deliberately been misleading here because what I've done is used different scales for the graph. So on the left, it's 0 to 8 seconds. On the right, it's 0 to 80 milliseconds. If I change that to the same scale graph, we can see that in this case, we can drop out the garbage collection pauses completely. And if we look at the percentile graph at the bottom, we can see that at the 99.99 graph, uh, we suddenly see a, a massive rise in terms of the uh, latency. On the right hand side, that as well is completely dropped out. So the 99th percentile is not a problem for us. A little bit about the Falcon JIT compiler. As I said, this is a replacement for the C2 JIT compiler. What we do there is again, look around and find there's a really good compiler project called LLVM. It's been around for 20 years. Lots of people are contributing to it and making it a really good back end for a compiler to generate heavily optimized code. We've integrated that into our JVM, contributed back the changes that we needed for that, and it allows us to do things like better intrinsics, more inlining, fewer compiler excludes. As an example of that, if we look at a piece of code like this, what we're doing is processing arrays of elements which are integers. And we're doing something fairly simple, which is to add elements from one array to another, but only if the second element is even. If you give that to most normal compilers, they will struggle to figure out that you can use vector instructions, single instruction, multiple data to improve the efficiency of that. And if we look at the code that's generated from the hotspot JVM, we don't need to worry about all of the individual instructions here. But what we can see are the red boxes. The big red box represents the body of the loop and the small red boxes indicate that the performance improvement, the optimization that's happened in terms of hotspots C2 JIT compiler is only loop unrolling. It's managed to do two elements per iteration of the loop, but nothing more than that. If we look at the same thing with the Falcon JIT compiler, and this is running on a specific type of Xeon processor that supports AVX2 instructions, that's a very wide register, 256 bits. What we can do is we can actually lay those integer objects out in that very wide register, and then apply the same operation to all of the elements in a single clock cycle. By doing that, we can see that the, the picture now looks a little bit more complicated, but what's happening here is by using both the AVX2 instructions and doing four times loop unrolling, we're doing 32 elements per iteration 
eight of which are done in parallel. That gives much better performance for numerically intensive operations. And again, that's only one example of what we can do here. Last thing to talk about is the ReadyNow warm-up elimination technology. And so what we see here is the idea of allowing an application to start up, go through that warm-up phase where we've identified the methods that need to be compiled, we've gone through the C1 compilation, we've gone through the Falcon compilation, we have heavily optimized code, and we're at a steady state. We can then record a profile of that which contains four pieces of information. First is all the classes that are currently loaded, then we've got all the classes that are currently initialized, and then profiling data that was collected whilst the code was compiled and whilst it was um, being used, and most importantly, speculative optimizations which failed. This is where we made an assumption about how the code was being used. That turned out to be wrong. We had to throw away the code and recompile it. If we can avoid making those mistakes in future, then it's going to make our code better. We can collect that information over a long period of time, so we could wait two minutes, we could wait two hours, we could wait two weeks if we want to collect that information. It really depends on what's the optimum time for your application. When we start the application again, rather than going through the whole process of the identification of the methods that are hot and, and recompiling them and so on, we simply take all that information, load all the classes we can, initialize all the classes we can, and then compile the methods we need using that profiling data. By the time you get to main, you're running about 98% of the, the performance level you had before you, when you took the, uh, the, the uh, profile. Run a few transactions and you're 100%. The reason we can't do 100% straight away is because there are limitations on the way the JVM works, things like um, Lambda expressions and the invoke dynamic limit what we can do there. In terms of the impact on latency, what we can see here is that the graph is similar to the one we saw before where we've got um, latency and the orange line shows the sort of warm-up where we're compiling code, we're doing some pauses to do the compilation, we're also doing some de-optimizations and throwing co code away and recompiling it. With the blue line, which is after ReadyNow is being used, we can see that's much more flat-lined and eliminating the problem of latency of the compilation during warm-up. Last thing to talk about related to that is compile stashing, because what we find is that the graph that we see here is without compile stashing. So the application starts up, but there's this blank period where we have to do all of the class loading, we have to do all the compilation and so on. To get around that, we now take a copy of all of the classes which have been compiled when we take the profile. And by using the fact that the LLVM compiler is fully deterministic, we know that with the same inputs, we get the same output. So we can reuse that code without having to recompile. So we can eliminate by up to 80% the compile time. We can eliminate by up to 60% the CPU load and get almost the perfect graph in terms of quick performance. Just to summarize then, basically what we're talking about here is improving Java performance. And as I said, it's the idea of being able to start fast so we can collect, we can reuse profiles to reduce that warm up time. We can go faster by using alternative JIT compilation strategies, generating more heavily optimized code. And then we can stay fast by eliminating those garbage collection, either stop the world pauses, um, issues around um, how the garbage collector works by using our read barrier. So it's really about us trying to deliver the best possible performance for Java applications. And as I say, the most important thing here is doing it in a way that we don't have to actually change any of the code. We can simply reuse the existing class files, the existing jar files, and everything will work in exactly the way that we want it to. So with that, I would just like to say thank you very much, and I hope this presentation has been of interest.